My name is Naomi Stead and I'm a professor and head of the Department of Architecture at Monash University. Um, and this series is a collaboration between Parler and Monash Architecture. Um, as always, we begin with uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands upon which we are all located, of course, across, across the whole nation today. Um, and on behalf of Parlo, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country across Australia's many nations and recognise continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to elders past and present and to the Indigenous Australians who are part of the Parla community. As always, uh, keep your microphone on mute unless you're actually speaking. Um, we do love it if you can leave your camera on, if you've got the bandwidth to do that. It's really uh, great to be able to see your faces and to have a sense of connection and a sense that we are in fact all at an event together. So these events are informal but informative. Uh, Naomi and I will be asking questions of Margaret throughout and keeping things flowing. Uh, but of course, we really also uh, like to have questions from you, the audience, throughout as well. So if you have got a question, put it into the chat function. Um, and uh, we'll be keeping an eye, our eye on that with, with our colleague Susie. Um, we'll select questions that, you know, work with the flow of the conversation. And we'll ask you if you're able to turn your camera on, to, or to turn on your audio and to put your question verbally to us. Um, if you're not able to do that, just make a note in the chat and we, of course, can also ask the question on your behalf. Um, we really like to know what you think um, and to understand your, your own experiences and it really helps that conversation. Um, so put observations and experiences also into the chat and um, many of you will know we've had some really lively discussions going on in that chat which is really um, helpful we can't go to all the questions but we can um, they do really inform what we're doing next with this series but also uh, what we're thinking about in terms of other parlor activities too um, so Naomi would you like to introduce Margaret I would very much like to introduce Margaret. Are you, do you want to leave up the holding slide, Justine? Or do you want to... um, no, I'm just, no, just give me a minute. There we okay, go. Great. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so um, this session, as Justine mentioned, is called Know Thyself, and it's particularly about how you identify your strengths, both professional and personal, how you can build effectively on character traits, commitments, and skills. And Margaret is just the person to help us do that. And I can say that with some expertise because uh, Margaret has been my coach. Um, uh, and I must say an absolutely excellent coach, but also has worked with uh, the department at Monash, the Department of Architecture, on um, team development, strategic planning, um, and organizational development generally. So Margaret is um, a highly qualified expert, facilitator, consultant, and executive coach. Um, she particularly works at the executive level, but I believe um, has experience at every level. She's an accredited administrator of the Myers-Briggs type indicator and a number of other um, uh, scales. Um, she has also had a very broad experience of leadership roles, including being mayor of a large metropolitan council, a coach and mentor to CEOs, uh, executive senior and frontline managers, um, and uh, membership on a number of not-for-profit boards and committees. Um, Margaret's not specifically an expert in architecture, but actually we think that's a strength because uh, she's able to see us with quite clear eyes. Um, and I can tell you, she is really quite remarkable in terms of helping people to um, navigate some extremely tricky uh, professional quandaries and dilemmas. So Margaret, thank you very much for joining us. It's so great that you could be here. You're um, I thought I might start with the kind of the the obvious question, given the thematic of our session here, how can we identify our own strengths? Okay, well, <clears throat> first thing to under is, I think, sort of get an, a sense of what strengths are. Um, strengths are naturally occurring uh, characteristics and um, they include virtues, they include the values that you, that you support in your practice. Um, and they generally are described as those things that enable you to achieve optimal functioning. Sounds a bit like a machine, but you get, you get the sense. So how do you identify them? It's, it's, it's quite personal. You identify your strengths by understanding 
what ignites your passion, what engages you, what enables you to stay motivated, what things you do that um, it, that create flow in the in the uh, work or the personal characteristics of your life. So ways of, of recognizing strengths would um, are sometimes strengths are not all that clear to us. They they're they're clear by way of um, looking at what what things are you not paying attention to may in fact uncover your strengths. So questions like um, what energizes and inspires you? What motivates you quite naturally? What, what ex you know, where do you get your energy from? Other questions that might uh, give you an insight, though, equally, are, are what things exasperate you? Because often, what exasperates you in other people will be the thing, the frustration that you feel that people can't do things that you can do easily, and they they are your strengths. Um, another question that you might find useful is what compliments are you likely to dismiss? Um, the compliments that you dismiss are often the things that you take for granted yourself and don't feel the need to uh, overt or, uh, or exaggerate. And again, they can be pointers to your strengths as well. Um, and the last question, which is a little bit more obtuse, is what are the things you think about when you've got nothing to think about? And you will tend to go to the things that you really enjoy uh, or, or are connected to. And uh, that will be another nice pointer for you. There's also instruments that you can do. And I've, I've, given, um, I've given Justine some, some handouts that she can send you after the session to explore the, the instruments that might help you as well. <laughs> mm. So, Margaret, I love this idea that one of your strengths might be in the areas of where, where you dismiss compliments. So, how do we deal with the kind of um, doubleness of that, that we might not, we might undervalue our own strengths because they come naturally to us? Yeah, and there is a real risk of, um, of both underuse and overuse of values. And I think that uh, particularly when we are in uh, professions that do connect with our strengths and, and you know, uh, everyone in, that I can see on screen is is female. Oh, except for Jeff. <laughs> um, <laughs> just noticed you, Jeff. <laughs> um, is, is that we are inclined to minimise uh, the things that define our competence, or our expertise, or our excellence. And if we're not clear about those strengths, it can make it very difficult to position ourselves at best advantage. And, and women are particularly inclined to do this, is to is, uh, you know, minimise the, the things that we bring to bear, minimise the things we can add value to, minimise the stretch or the challenge that we may be able to address by not being aware of those things we can do or looking at the things we can do through other people's eyes. Get an external perspective about what other people think of you and what you can do. Uh, that will often be a useful insight as well. Mm. So, Margaret, would you advocate that people should use their strengths in terms of career planning? I mean, a lot, a lot of what we've heard from the many speakers in this series is that people haven't necessarily planned their careers in a kind of, yeah. um, you know, systematic way, but it's been somewhat ad hoc, ad hoc, somewhat planned, somewhat strategy, somewhat tactics. So how much do you think this should play into planning? Uh, my, view on, my view on career planning is that it's... Um, how do I put this? Career planning is not a static thing. Career planning is 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 uh, circumstantial. It's um, it's related to our, our levels of maturity, our levels of development as a person. All of those things are important. In and as is the the fit that you have with a particular culture, or the um, the sense of meaning that you get from the work that you do. So for me, the real risk um, with career planning is that we get trapped by our expertise. So as people in the, in the architecture field, sometimes, and I have a different background and whether you're a lawyer or, or whatever, um, that we can feel a bit uh, on, a, on, a, on a railroad track. So we've qualified in this area, so we should stick to it because we've invested so much in, in doing it and our experience has, um, has, has taken us even further along that track. My suggestion is always put rubber wheels on your train so you can veer off a little bit, take different pathways. It doesn't mean that you need to leave your career behind, 
but you can do a bit of exploring and off off road um, traveling and and in that sense your strengths can come into play so what are the things that really give me a sense of meaning in the contribution I want to make at this stage in my life in my career um, do I feel still feel energized and challenged by what I'm doing you know is it is this something that I see myself doing for the rest of my working life or do I or do I want to dial it up or dial it down or take a sideways shift I've worked with lots and lots of people who have um, made sense of their career by deciding that it's an element of what they've been trained in doing that really inspires them rather than the whole package. Mm. So for me, it's neither a, a strategy or a tactic really. For me, it's about, uh, it's, it's about finding that sort of, um, uh, that awareness or that connection to, to what I want to do, how I want to add value in the world. Mm. We'll come back to questions about what people do in the current well, circumstances like the current situation where they might find themselves with reduced choice. But mm. first of all, um, I wanted to ask you about weaknesses. So, of course, the counterpart to strengths is weaknesses. And yeah. how important is it to be aware of the areas that we're not so naturally good at? And what do we do with that knowledge? Yeah. Um, again, <clears throat> and I do a lot of, um, I do a lot of work with, with um people who are going for jobs or looking for career changes, and they always ask me that question. Um, you know, how, how do I identify my weaknesses and how do I compensate for them? And for me, it's the wrong question. So, sorry, Naomi, you didn't mean No, no, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> for me, it's the wrong question. If you assume that we all have a, a, a complete range of strengths, you can also assume that some strengths we are better at using, some strengths we are habitually more comfortable with because we've practiced them. The thing about weaknesses for me is, is often um, it's, it's uh, a weakness is an underused or underdeveloped strength. So mm -hmm. it might be that if you look at something that you know, you, you want to express more fully, it might be that you do a little bit of development around practicing in that strength. It doesn't mean that it's going to be a signature strength. It doesn't mean that it's going to re-identify who you are, but you can, you know yourselves from your own experience, you can develop, um, you can develop skills and competencies in areas that don't necessarily come naturally. Now, for me, it's detail. Detail does not come naturally to me. But my strength of perseverance means that I'm going to learn it and I'm going to get good at it, um, even though it, I'll never choose to do it as a first option. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. So it might be effortful, but you, you, you can do yeah, it. You can do it, yeah. And you, the other option that you can do with your weaknesses is, and again, I, I don't like to use that word. I have a positive psychology sort of mindset, which is, how do we leverage what works rather than what's a problem we need to fix? Mm. Um, so it might be that you, if, if, if you identify a weakness through this particular uh, process that I'm about to describe, I want you to know that it's in fact not a weakness. So mm. if you identify a weakness by looking at somebody else who does something better or more easily than you, mm. The feedback I'd ask you to accept is that the only way that you can see that particular characteristic or strength is because you already have capacity to do it. You can't see what you have no experience of. So if you see someone who is better, a better networker than you, or someone who's a better public speaker than you, or someone who's a better, um, uh, you know, better at detail or better at strategic thinking, whatever it might be, my assumption is that you, you have the capacity, it's just underdeveloped. Or you have a bit of, um, or you have some assumptions about your ability to do those things that are worth challenging. Mm -hmm. You might have had a bad experience that set you up for, I'm never going to go there again because I'm no good at it. When in fact, if you take a learner's mindset, you may not have been good at it because you didn't really understand how or what it meant. Do you, do you see where I'm coming from? Mm. So for me, it's an ongoing exploration of all that's available to you in the strengths range. It's, it's, and, and not being so hard on yourself. Can I ask a question about this? Because one of the, I think um, we've 
been running this lovely series called Letter to My Younger Self on Parlour, where people, you know, offer advice to themselves, but of course they're really offering advice to others. Yep. One of the things that's come up in them and in a range of other things are, are women in particular saying, I wish I hadn't spent so much time trying to improve on things I wasn't yep. that good at, and I wish yep. I'd actually worked really played to my strengths. So yeah. how does that fit into um, the frame? I mean, what you're saying makes yeah. lots and lots yeah. of sense, but um, how do yeah. we choose where we put our energy, I guess, is partly the question. Yeah. And I, look, I think self-awareness is a really important part of all of our development. Being aware, being aware of, of what our stories are that we tell ourselves. So the stories that, that we tell ourselves about ourselves. And that, that notion of you know, one of the stories that's very common amongst everybody, um, and you know, we'll will include women in this as well, is is the not what I call the not good enough story. So somewhere mm. we've internalised that we're not good enough for whatever on whatever topic or for whatever reason. And if the story was was internalised or interjected as opposed to projected, interjected as a child, then we really challenge the data or the assumptions upon which that belief was formed. So we go through life and all we're doing is looking for examples that confirm the belief as opposed to challenging it. And so the, the not good enough story is really worth challenging. I mean, the question I would ask is, would you take advice from your six or eight or 10 year old self, wherever it was that you internalized <laughs> that you know good at something or you know good at, you know, it, it logically we get it, but it's so deeply embedded into our belief systems that it really needs a bit of a poke to uncover what that layer is. Mm. So I think I got lost in there somewhere, Justine. Did I answer the question? <laughs> oh, it's, it's very interesting. Um, Mamie, we've got lots happening in the chat. Shall we? We do, yeah. In fact, I wondered if we might go back to um, Badru. Ahmed has a very good question exactly about modesty. Question. <laughs> yes. Do you want to put that question, Badru? Are you still here? Where are you, Badru? Oh, we may have connection issues, possibly. Um, if you're here, Badru, please break in. But basically, the question is about how one identifies and expresses strengths whilst retaining modesty. Oh, I yeah. always feel, she says, sorry. oh, there you oh, are. Here Badru. she is, Badru. Yes. Sorry, sorry. Tech That's issues, it. tech issues. <laughs> Um, you your camera, can you put your camera on, Badru? Unfortunately not. I've got a very oh, that's all right. okay. uh, system. Anyway. Yep. Um, so, um, sorry about that. Um, the question that I had is actually what I wrote there is um, this is a very, it's finding it very difficult to balance modesty with uh, identifying my strengths. Yeah. Because yep. I like to think I'm a modest person. I grew up in a very modest culture. Yes. Um, so, um, and then it's a vicious cycle because sometimes I feel like, oh, I'm underselling myself. And funny, because we're having this talk now, just a yes. um, few weeks ago, my boss told me at work that I always gave people too much credit. Yes. Uh, and, um, you know, I told him better positive than negative. And that actually made me think that was I being too modest with my strengths that I wasn't saying them enough? And how can I balance them, really? Yeah. And it's a great question. And it's probably, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's doesn't justify a quick answer, Badri, but basically what you're saying is that, um, and, and this, is, this is kind of the overlay or the intersection of, um, of our cultural um, heritage around, you know, what we think we should or shouldn't do, um, and what we've been told and we've, we've internalised as rules of behaviour. And the first thing I'd like to say to you is be aware of context. So I would not want to mess with your um, cultural context at all. So who you are within your family and within your social circumstances, we're not talking about that, but take it into a context of work. And what you'll find is that a lot of the rules that you live your life by in your private life are actually problematic in the work situation. So you kind of almost have to modify your own rules of engagement in the context of work to enable yourself to be treated seriously, to be seen as an equal professional, to further your career and all of those things. So you're not being egotistical, citing your strengths in a work context. You're actually providing information about how those strengths can be used to further the outcomes of the organisation or the project or the initiative. Do, do, am I making sense? Oh so, yes, that oh, is such a, sorry, yeah. sorry, go ahead. 
No, no, go, you go on. Uh, no, that's such a lovely thing to say, what you just mentioned about context, because that really puts things into perspective that, like, who I have to be somewhere else, I don't have to be that same person at work. Yes. And um, that actually does, it's actually a very, very good response, to be honest with you. Yeah. And it, you're still authentic. You, you can't not be you. You yeah. know, the, the thing is, you can't not be you, but you can, you can moderate the expression of you depending on the situation that you're in. Mm. Wow, that I wish I received that advice ten years ago. But hey, better late than never. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, um, Margaret. I wonder if I could ask you a little bit about how coaching works, because it was a mm. we were having a discussion a few weeks back. In fact, when we first started thinking about the concept of know thyself um, and how important it is to come to um, well, an ancient idea, of course, but how important it is to know know yourself and then know, as you say, what you can contribute to an organisation. Mm. And one of the things that we were discussing, I think it was Sue Wittenoom, was it? I can't quite remember. But we were talking about coaching as a really useful, formal yeah. way to try and come to that kind of knowledge. Can you tell us how that works? Yeah. Look, for me, coaching is the ultimate um, professional development option for you if you've got the right coach. And I really want to emphasise that there, that, that choosing the right coach is, is critically important. So what is coaching? Coaching is a one-on-one -on -one conversational experience that enables you to have full um, full presence and connection with somebody whose only interest is in your professional development and your um, and enhancing your outcomes so it's your outcomes that define the conversation not the coaches so the coach would always start with what it, what is it that you're looking for out of the coaching experience and outcomes are, are different from outputs, guys. So outputs are, I want a new job. An outcome what might be the sort of characteristics or qualities of the role that you're looking for. The output of that conversation might be a different job, if you can see, see what I mean. So quite often um, coaching conversations for me, and my particular style is a, is a bit of a blend between coaching, consulting and mentoring. Um, pure coaching is very questions based. And for me, I get I, I don't like coaches that are only pure question because I, I figure I'm, I'm looking for somebody who's going to give me a bit of wisdom as well, not just ask me to kind of dig into the depths of my own experience. However, that can be really useful as well, because one of the really important skills of a good coach is to help you uncover your own cognitive bias, your blind spots, the mind traps, the limiting beliefs you might have, the assumptions that have not been checked in a, um, the data that you're using to, you know, to build your case around. All of those are, you know, they, it, it, it should be a reasonably challenging conversation, but with compassion, empathy and um, an understanding of your context. Mm. Mm. And Margaret, I'm, I'm kind of painfully aware that many people in this conversation are either feeling that their work is precarious at the moment. Some, some people yeah. are looking for work. Some people have been made redundant. So obviously not everyone's in a position to access coaching at the moment. Yeah. So um, are there informal techniques that people can use without a coach or to, you know, informal coaching? Yeah, look, I think, um, I think mentoring is the, is the next best option. Personally, I think all of you, if you don't have a mentor, should have at least one. I would suggest more than one. Mentors, generally, uh, you identify a, men a mentor with a particular um, connection to an area of interest or support for you. Uh, the the, the pe people, I really do sympathise and, and empathise with some of you who are in that crossroads of your career at the moment. It's tough for a lot of people. A lot of us are having to reinvent ourselves. Um, those awful now overused terms like adapt and pivot. Um, this too will pass, will be something that I'd like to, to say to you that, you know, that whilst we are going into a recession and this is, would be annus horribilis for a lot of us, um, it, is, it is going to pass. I've been around long enough to know that I, and been through a few of these cycles that it's horrible when you're in it, but it, you do look back and you can learn a lot having been through what you're going through at the moment, so long as it's not threatening your livelihood or your, or your, you know, your, your security. Mm -hmm. um, so I think mentoring is really good. The other thing that I'd highly recommend 
um, is networking. Maintain your networks. Do things like this and many other things. There are many other options that you might have at your, at your disposal. But maintain, if I was coaching you to, you know, get another job or if I was coaching you to um, reset your career, uh, your career outcomes, whatever it would be, the first thing I would say is start activating your network. Networks are incredibly important and I think women generally also tend to underutilise them. And I'm not talking about formal networking, going and talking to strangers. I'm talking, tell people what you're looking for. Let them be your agents or your, your sort of board of, um, board of directors in, in whatever the context is that you want. Let them know, let them help you. Just put your hand up if you'd be prepared to be in someone's network that's, that, that is part of this um, experience for you. If anyone rang you, put your hand up if you'd be happy to respond positively. Yeah? You know, to me, it's, it's we don't ask because we're frightened of the response that we'll get. We, you know, all of us avoid rejection. You kind of got to suck it up, guys, and just pick up the phone or send an email and say, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm just wanting 10 minutes of your time or can we have a, an online coffee or whatever it might be. I just need to talk... A, a, out, you know, talk a few things over with you. Find your friendlies would be my suggestion. <laughs> Not yes, see so, so many people sort of nodding in recognition through all of this, Margaret. It's very um, <laughs> good. It's really lovely. I, I wondered if we might just, Kimberly, we has got a really good question, or she's got quite a few, but she's got a good question about building up confidence building up the confidence to take compliments, which I know is going back slightly in the conversation, but I wonder if we might, I think that was a good question. Kimberly, do you want to put your question in a little bit more detail? Oh, it's not really a question I've oh. just seen. Oh, hi, Margaret, thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. Um, it's not really a question, but I just find that um, echoing Badger's statement, it's like we, I don't know, for me, I've always been brought up to be humble and such, and so when mm -hmm. people tell me, that I'm doing things well, it feels like it's because I'm just doing what I've been told to yeah. the best as well. And it kind of reflects on that whole imposter syndrome because I think that statement lately has kind of come onto my radar more and more. And it mm. took me a while to recognize that I have been having imposter syndrome. And mm. yeah, it's, mm. I think it's just trying to be okay with the compliments and be okay mm. to say that you did well to yourself and being nice to yourself at the end okay. of the day. Sorry, it wasn't really yeah, yeah. No, no, it's okay. Okay, there's a couple of things that I want to I wanna say first, um, Kimberly. Thanks for the question. Um, the first thing is you're not alone. Every single person in the world has some form of imposter syndrome unless you are a pathological psychopath. <laughs> and we all know some of those. <laughs> so the first thing is that an imposter syndrome is perfectly normal. But the other thing um, to be aware of is that I always find when people say to me, I want more confidence. For me, confidence can't be put in a wheelbarrow. It's not a thing that you can address. Confidence for me is a bit of a container for a whole lot of things, including, and I'm going to, I'm just going to, I'm just going to apply my intuition for you, Kimberly, including um, uh, self-esteem. So it's not that you have low self-esteem, but I think that you are perhaps uncomfortable with who you are becoming, not who you were, but who you're becoming. So who am I becoming? I'm becoming... Um, I'm becoming an experienced, capable, um, informed professional. I am compassionate. I am. So the question, who am I becoming? I'm compassionate. I'm kind. I am. Perhaps I have an introverted preference in my personality. Perhaps. Mm -hmm. But none of that is a problem. It's simply awareness of who am I, who am I becoming as I develop in my, in my life and in my career. So taking compliments is triggering for you an old story. And a little bit like the, the same response that I had for Badru, it would be more um, not so much allowing the, comp the, the compliment in. It's really easy to say those things. 
but I want you to start practicing just saying thank you without giggling or without squirming. Okay. So if I say to you, that was a really good question and it's, it's helping a lot of people who are listening really understand what, uh, what compliments are about in the workplace. Answer me. Thank you. Now don't squirm, say it again. Okay, oh my God, I can't do this because there's so many people. Um, thank you very much and I really appreciate your thought out answer. To and this. I'm pleased I could help. Thank you. Yeah, because you're someone who's here to help. You should have it on your T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> And I think some, a, lot, a lot of what we do in the, in the way that we, we provide service through our career is, um, is, is really, it's really important that we enable ourselves to be acknowledged. It's, it's a, kind of our sense of purpose in doing what we do. We want, to, we want to help. We want to support people. We want to make a difference. We want to add value. We want to you know, uh, have a, we want to contribute to the long-term um, planning and design of our communities or our infrastructure, whatever it might be. Uh, it, it's really important that you allow that acknowledgement in because it's actually the feedback we need to keep going. Mm. I think that's incredibly helpful as a, um, a squirmer from a long time ago who still squirms. Um, <laughs> I also used to find, I used to often, people say nice things to you and you kind of downplay it. And, yeah. and it took me a long time to work out that in doing so, it's not very respectful for, to the person who's said that nice thing to you. Um, Absolutely. I think there's, a, so I've really been trying to teach myself just to say thank you. Like, mm -hmm. because I used to go thank you, oh, but it was easy or oh, but, or, oh, you know, just downplay it. And I, I think that's, that's a very cultural, you know, nice middle-class girl kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, but just taking that deep breath and saying thank you is also about um, not downplaying the other person. That That's right. And, and if you want to make it even easier for you, so try, try this one, Justine, if it fits with your personality. I'm a squirmer. Thank, thank, <laughs> no, that's all right. Just say thank you. That's very kind. Thank you. That's very kind. Now what's happened, what, what's happened is you've flung it back Yes. To them. So you've acknowledged the effort that the other person's gone to mm. to give you the feedback. Mm. Yes, this is fabulous, this live coaching. I think we all want you, Margaret. We all. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wonder, Naomi, if we might just flip a little bit to talk about it from an organisational perspective. Um, uh, our audience is always a mix of people who are employees, employers, and all sorts of other kind sure. of roles. Um, but I wonder if we um, think not only about our own strengths, but how we manage others so that they can play to their strengths and that yeah. that can be to the benefit of an organisation rather than, again, um, kind of having a whole lot of people you're trying to put into boxes that don't fit in or whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, and I think right. absolutely, so it's a, it's a lot of what I do is, is working with groups and teams and organisations as well. And, and again, understanding... Um, what people, you know, what are the, first of all, you start with what are the priorities of the organisation and then have a conversation around what strengths do I bring to, to contribute to the achievement of that, of those priorities. So for me, it's not, what are your strengths? Now let's design the job around your strengths. That's, that's, you know, it's the wrong way around. It's more, I've, I'm in, I'm in a contract with this organisation to provide input and contribute to the out to the priorities. So what are they? What strengths do I bring to contribute? Now, the thing about strengths is that it's not an excuse to, you know, to sort of prioritise what you want to do or not want to do. Um, it might be that it's a really good insight into development opportunities for individuals who are perhaps in a role that don't have the full range of strengths required to, you know, to complete that task. Or it might be that you recognise that um, the strengths that you are using at work are a bit overused and you're looking for a broader challenge. So I think there's, for me, it comes out in the conversation with your team. But start with what are our outcomes? What are our priorities? What strengths do we apply? And you can use any of the instruments. Um, I, I, the, the, there's another one called Strengths Finder that I've given Justine to circulate as well, which is more in more uh, organizationally oriented 
and you can have a look at where the gaps are or where the where the clusters are. And again, it's not about just assuming that what people say are their strengths is it. You can learn those these these other things. So broadening people's range, you know, um, in shadowing, matching people up, um, you know, internal coaching programs, internal mentoring programs can all be really helpful. Mm. And Margaret, how does, if we're thinking about organisations, how do um, strengths and the strengths that we recognise play into ideas about cultural fit, quote unquote, cultural fit? Um, and at Parlo, we're always wary of the notion of cultural fit yeah. because it yeah. can very often be a mask for bias. Yeah. Um, and people are actually looking for people who are just like themselves. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. So how does strength, strength organisational strengths play into that? How do we avoid? Yeah, I think mm -hmm. it, it's a, it, it's quite a complex uh, question that you you've asked, and I agree with you. I think it's um, it goes to the the whole um, the whole notion of uh, what is culture and how is it established. So for me, culture is very simply put the way we do things around here, and it's it, it involves a, a set of of norms and uh, and and those norms are values based collectively values based and there are behaviors that should be articulated around well how do we do those values that we that we, so if we've got um if we've got a value like uh, trust or respect in our cultural norm then how do we do cultural uh, how do we do uh, trust and respect here what does it look like in practice the thing about fit for me it's not about fit to a personality type or to a style of working it's fit to those values. You can't be in a culture if you don't have alignment with the, with the shared value set. And if you don't have a sense of connection to the shared outcome of that workplace as well. So when, when it's used to talk about, well, you're not like me, therefore you don't fit, I, I actually get quite cross too. So I get what you're saying. It's, it's you know, we can tolerate an enormous amount of diversity if we're all aligned more or less to those shared values and we understand and practice those behaviors and we have the skills and expertise to contribute to the priorities um, of the organization so mm -hmm. it, it really does um, it's the bias that selection processes have that you're talking about and that's what you've got to be really careful about my suggestion was would be always have an outsider on the panel who will challenge you around those uh, who'll challenge those bias, mm. that bias, sorry. Mm. Um, Brian Cloacy is uh, in the conversation. He's suggested the term cultural ad. I haven't heard that before, Brian. Do you want to explain what that is? Hi, Naomi. Um, uh, it's just that we've, when we did some unconscious bias training, someone said that this notion of cultural fit would start to get us, we, we, would, we would bring our biases to it and look to them in a different yes. way. And they, I thought, had a lovely suggestion where they said, think of it as cultural ad. Well, what would they bring that would actually stretch ah. our culture and make us more diverse than that? And I really loved it. So we yeah. changed the question in that because I, I have to confess, I used to love talking about cultural fit and how you would come in and fit yeah. in, in our organization. And since we flipped it to ad, I really like it because it makes us think as reviewers when we go back over uh, someone yeah. who we just met, well, how would they add to the culture? Not like how are they going to fit in here? What would they bring to it that maybe we don't have already? And I think it, it opens up in a really nice way the possibility of our, uh, the strengths or something that, or the differences that that person has that would be really good for yeah, awesome. absolutely. That's lovely. Thank you for that. I'm going to I'm going to steal that if I may. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because I guess the other thing about that, Brian, is that cultural fit tends to imply that the organisation will stay the same, whereas yes. cultural ad tends to imply evolution and change. Precisely. And the the other thing that is really important, I think, when you when you describing culture, is describe it using an iterative narrative. So it goes to what you've just said, Naomi. It's not static. An iterative narrative will develop and emerge and change, particularly in the current times of fluidity. I mean, there's week to week things are changing. So what's our narrative? So who are we? What do we stand for? What's our, our sense of purpose? Um, what are our priorities? What do we value? What are the behavioural protocols that we support or not support? 
And in that narrative, and there's threads, you can kind of combine the threads in any way you like for different audiences too. But leaders particularly, and managers, team leaders, who wherever you are, if you're responsible for people, you need to have um, a good, hopeful, future-focused narrative, particularly at the moment, mm -hmm. which encapsulates all that you're talking about. Mm. Yeah. We've got what? a... We've got a request for some more online immediate coaching here from Badru. <laughs> Badru, do you want yes. to come back on and ask you? I think we'll all benefit from this one. <laughs> yes, yes. But uh, maybe Kimberly can uh, be the person again since my unpredictable body <laughs> camera has died. Sorry to put you on the spot, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> Sl slowly, slowly patting my camera on the top. <laughs> We can, uh, we can open um, to the floor if anyone has a question or an issue that they'd like to... I don't want to put Kimberly on the spot again. <laughs> no, no Badru's got a specific question. She just can't oh. do the example. Um, <laughs> got it. But basically, if um, how can I say thank you like, and also address the greater team? Because I always try to act the oh. way and I think, how would that make me feel? Like I try to put myself in the other person's shoes and I've seen colleagues or co-workers would be like yeah yeah thank you thank you and it's like oh nobody else exists here but um i don't want to be that person and i know i don't want to be that person okay so I, yeah. i'm i'm an ex-english teacher a long time ago yeah and i like to use language i think language is incredibly powerful yeah and so think about pronouns i we me us uh, they, them, you know, think about any range of pronouns. And I think this is a really, really clever way of acknowledging yourself and your own contribution in a compliment whilst not dismissing the contribution of others. So, for example, I'm really grateful that you've, you know, I'm, I, this is formal language and you wouldn't say it this way necessarily, but I'm really grateful for uh, the acknowledgement of the work that we completed. Okay. okay but I've you've got to acknowledge the I in there uh, because other, if you can, if you minimize yourself and just say, oh, it wasn't all up to me, what have you just, you know, oh, sorry, I'm asking questions like I'm facilitating. I'm not going <laughs> to. Um, if, if you do that, what you do is you diminish your contribution. But similarly, you also minimise minimise the impact of everybody's contribution at the same time. And mm -hmm. really subtle shifts in your language will make a huge difference. Yeah. So I led, and we delivered. I initiated, and we can and we can you know we participated, whatever it might be. But use the two, the in the the singular and the plural in the same sentence is a really good way. Starting with the singular. Uh, that brings me to another point now that you've mentioned language. I still struggle to write I in office emails. Well, stop it. You know, I, 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 str <laughs> I can see the English tutor in you now. <laughs> like, I always tend to write we, we, we. Yeah, some decisions are we because I'm writing on behalf of a bigger team. But uh -huh. some decisions are I because yep. I am saying, please issue the drawing or hey, please do this. Yes. Yep. And I struggle and I still write, we, we request the drawing. And I'm like, who is we? Who yep. is requesting for it? <laughs> yep. And it's not, it's, not, it's not personal enough. And we will get, let other people off the hook too because there's no accountability to we. Yeah. And th because there's no one in the CC sometimes except for the project inbox. And you're like, so who's we, me and the project? Like, mm. <laughs> so yeah. So my <laughs> first answer still stands, Badri. Stop it. Uh -huh. <laughs> Okay, cool. I will. I will. I will definitely try to stop it. But I will. No, I will stop. No, 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 no. no I will no, stop no, it. That's the that's language. Better. Yeah, yeah. I will stop it. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Badru. Excellent questions. Um, we we've we're kind of coming closer to the end, and Justine and I wanted to close on advice specifically for the current times, which we've already touched upon. Yeah. Um, and Margaret, you've talked about um some advice for those who are trying to find their feet now like yes. sort of entering a career now what about people who are in mid-career who who perhaps have been faced with an unexpected and possibly unwanted uh, career break or career change what advice would you give to them i actually think one of the things is in the you know the strengths and positive psychology kind of context that we're talking in is to see it as an opportunity i, I think with every major change comes extraordinary opportunity for 
reinventing yourself, redefining yourself, getting out of the uh, the boxes that put people put you in, and you know limit your limit your uh, offer. Um, look, I'm not minimising the difficulty at the moment because, and, and I think the difficulty will probably go on for a while. But I still believe that there are niche opportunities emerging that you should be paying attention to. Be careful not to be looking for your dream job in times like this. Look for anything that will get you in the door that then enables you to navigate different pathways once you're in. That would be the first thing I'd suggest. I think we, we don't have the luxury at the moment of choice and, and lots of opportunity. So, you know, I'm, I'm talking to quite a few people in this position at the moment. And my suggestion is don't be too picky. However, be very clear what your selection criteria is, short, medium and long term within that pathway. And a really good exercise I'd like to leave you with as, as, a, as a way of defining what your own selection criteria are. So it's not, selection criteria is not what job I want. It's what are the conditions in that, in that, uh, uh, in, in that role that I need met. And you can, you're looking for about an 80% fit, although you might see the entry point is a little bit further away from that. So long as you can see a pathway to get there in the short or medium term. So the questions, the, it's a really simple exercise and it, it's quite challenging. So the, you do this on your own and you can do it in any context, but we're talking career at the moment, is what do I want? So the, se the, the sentence starts, I want, and you have to write it five answers very quickly, don't overthink it. And then underneath each of those questions as a second step is because, and you want three to five becauses under each one of those first sentences. And again, don't overthink it. Just make sure that you then go back and have a look and what you'll have in front of you is a lovely list of possibilities to define your own selection criteria. That is an excellent exercise. <laughs> Thank you, Margaret. Everyone can do that for their homework. Um, just then, what can we do? Can we continue with the with that? Uh, the question about um, leaders. Um, yes, let's do that. And then, if we've got some time, we can come back to some of these questions. The questions, but I think that's quite a good question. So, yeah, uh, so Margaret, I know you've been working with um, a number of people, leaders, about how they can lead in times of change and cope with uncertainty. So what advice would you have for the leaders in the room? Yeah, I think the first thing is look after yourself. <clears throat> There's a lot of people relying on, on leaders at the moment to have the answers. And some of the, some of the, the traps that are, well, the risks for leaders in, in these really uncertain and, and uh, disruptive times is that people are looking for simple answers. They're overstating their need for certainty. They're overstating their need for um, what I call a beginning and a middle and an end to the story. So when will this be over? When will we know things are okay? And, and for me, it's for leaders, you really need to be aware that you can't collude with the anxiety of the, of the, uh, the group that you might be working with that your role is again in promoting that hopeful uh, narrative and it doesn't have to be unrealistic. You can, a narrative can be, this is what I do know. This is what I don't know. This is what we can focus on now. But the other thing I think for leaders in these times is also to, um, and it's a bit counterintuitive when everybody's sort of pushing up to you, expecting you to be the, the, the sort of holder of all the wisdom and the answers. The counterintuitive step is to engage in what I call generative conversation, which is, you know, what, what wisdom do we all bring to the situation? What are the questions that would be useful to address collectively at the moment? Rather than asking closed questions, ask open questions. What are the opportunities that are emerging out of this? What have we realised is no longer adding value in our practice? What is it that we can see is something that needs to be incorporated as we go forward. You know, what, what does agility and, and flexibility mean for us in this context at the moment? 
Um, what can we suspend temporarily that's going to get us by? You know, it's, um, I, I think that the, try, the, the risk for leaders is believing that they have to have the answers because nobody's got the answers at the moment. Mm. And it's certainly true that I've seen quite a few uh, leaders beginning to crumble. This has been going on for a very long time and a lot of people are very, very tired. So yes. I think your advice about looking after yourself is very good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Justine, what are we going to do now? You're mute, Justine. My daughter's just dyed her hair pale pink, so I had to sh I've turned off the sound while she was showing me. <laughs> Where are we? I'm just looking at the chat. Tim's point about designing um, programs or projects that give people a sense of, of uh, completion or, or, or positive um, contribution is really useful at the moment as well. So what, what can we do is a really good question. What's something that we can all invest in that, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's the simple of watching the office near ours. Uh, they're a restaurant and they've been closed for months, but they're painting and they're redecorating and they're, you know, they're, so that, that's in their context, obviously. What are the things you can do? We've, we've been exploring, well, you know, actually, can we work permanently from home? Do we need the office at all? Um, and there's, there's all sorts of things that you can do to engage people. It's not a distraction. It's still meaningful work, but it's there are things that maybe you didn't have time to do before. Mm. Or are they things that you need to let go to give you time to prioritise in other areas? Mm. Has my sound come back? Yeah. Oh, good. Mm. <laughs> Great. I think I've got the sound. No, it's gone weird again, Justine. <laughs> so, are there any other well, questions? Look, I tell you what, I wanted to um, I have a last question for you, Margaret. Can you hear this? Yes, okay. So, um, someone, it could be Jeff, um, was making reference to something which I haven't heard of before, but I think it might be what I have heard of and the Dunning-Kruger effect. Well, he's part of the Bukowski paradox that um, the world is full of intelligent people who are full of doubt and stupid ones who are full of confidence. Okay, um, you, might need, you, might need, you might need to type... Yeah, you might need to type your question. Um, oh, uh, sorry. You're dropping out, yeah. Yeah, all right. Um, Sorry about this, everyone. <laughs> First time it's gone really bad. <laughs> okay. I thought Damini had a good question. Damini, do you want to ask your question while we're waiting for Naomi to? Yeah. Um, sure. Thank you, Margaret. Um, that was very insightful. Definitely what I need right now. Oh, good. Um, so one thing you were saying at the beginning that really stood out was um, actually noticing uh, other people's skills or qualities and you're like, oh, yeah, they're really good at this. Um, yeah. Also kind of a reflection of something you have underlying or dormant in yourself. Yeah, or under underused, yeah. Yeah, um, so that's something I've noticed I do a lot where I'm like, oh, this person's really good at public speaking or, you know, yeah. um, conveying their concept or something really articulately. Um, so I, I've wanted to like develop those skills myself. And when you mentioned mm -hmm. that um, being something that I could develop, um, what are your advice or like your, um, you know, techniques into actually looking into our own skills and developing that same um, ability in ourselves? Yeah. Well, if you if you are identifying, I wish I could be better at that sort of notion, or I wish I I, I wish I, what you're actually talking about is um, a learning process. So, you know, when you're learning how to drive, you have L plates and P plates, and now you get two versions of P plates as well. So, my suggestion would be, as adults, we tend not to be very comfortable with L plates on. Um, and I think you've got to be able to realise that learning is a normal part of growing and developing and building your capability in your in your school base. So deliberately put yourself in learning opportunities. So it might be you're not going to do a full-on presentation to you know a hundred people, but speak it speak uh, 
authoritatively at a meeting would be a good start. You know, allow yourself to be the authority, allow yourself to be the expert and have a, a, an audience, albeit a small audience or a short period of time, but build your confidence around, um, around those skills. And you can, you can also do courses and things, of course, as well. But, uh, and I shouldn't, I shouldn't say too much about, I think courses are useful. They give you frameworks, but really the learning is in the, is in the practice. And it's the verb practice. It's got an S on it, which means you've got to do it. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's, that's something really hard. Um, also, uh, motivating yourself to, you know, do those things that you have less confidence in doing. Yeah, exactly. And make it easy would be my suggestion. Um, Domini, don't look for things that are, you know, don't go from zero to 100. You know, go from zero to five. And, and say, well, what, what's a step I can take to start to build my experience and my confidence in doing this? And as I said, if your presentation is the thing, you don't necessarily need to speak in front of 100 people. Um, I mean, I, the bigger the group, the better for me. I, I, I love it. But I've had a lot of years getting good at it. And my training originally was as a teacher. Thank you so much, Margaret. <laughs> Are you um, back with us, Naomi? Uh, I think I am. I yeah, don't know. You are back. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. I wanted to ask you, can I just take the chair's prerogative and ask you the last question, Margaret, which comes back to imposter syndrome? Yes. And particularly something that I have found very comforting, which is the so-called Dunning-Kruger effect. Mm where um, studies have shown that people who actually uh, know what they're talking about have, are more uncertain or yes. more, or I can't actually remember what the dunning Kruger yeah, effect yeah. is. Yeah. But basically, um, the more doubt you have, the more it shows that you know what you're talking about. Do you, do you have anything to comment on that? Yeah, it, it, it's a really interesting dynamic. My experience is the better people are at what they do, the more likely they are to compare their worst self to someone else's best self, if that makes sense. So you tend not to have realised how good you've become. You, you tend to always see, because we're driven, most of us are driven by challenge and stretch. It's a strength for most of us. Um, you know, bravery is a strength. Courage is a strength to step up and push yourself that little bit harder. But it is, and that's why I always say, just kind of accept that you've got your imposter syndrome as a little voice in your head. Um, I have one too. Everyone does. I don't know anyone who doesn't have one. As I said, unless you're, unless you're, um, you know, pathologically sociopathic or something. But for me, when it comes up, I just go, not now. And so allow it to, because the, the thing about the imposter syndrome is it can also be a bit of a driver. It can also help you strive that little bit harder. It can also help you be aware of what opportunities there are still to grow and develop in the, in the areas that you've become uh, good and, and authoritative in. It's not, it's not a universally bad thing. I just think it's, it's something that you don't want to inhibit your ability to be seen or to do what you do really well, to exercise your strength. So mm. when you feel that kind of imposter syndrome coming up, just not now. Mm. <laughs> that is an excellent note on which to finish, I think. Um, thank you so much, Margaret. I know that there's been, um, I'm hearing, I'm seeing in the chat that people have been taking very extensive notes and finding this extremely helpful. So thank you. It's very generous of you to share your wisdom. So often we do a virtual applause. Shall we do that? Round of applause. So thank you very much, Margaret, and thank you everyone for coming. And we will be back this time next week. Justine, what yeah, will next, we... This time next week, we're talking about that question of career shifts and career breaks. Um, we have two speakers, one of whom is Shelley Penn, and the other one of whom I'm afraid name escapes me at the moment. So there's a moment of professional polish for you all to witness. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we will, I think that will be a very good session. Um, I will have invitations and booking links and things up, if not Monday, Tuesday, but maybe I'll get it up for Monday. Um, I just want to reiterate though how I could, I just, so many of you come every week, so many of you come quite often, some of you are new and that's wonderful too, but it's really, um, we really do appreciate 
you participating because I think in many of the things we're talking about, about you know, networking and confidence and all those kinds of things, well, we would hope that at Parlour we do help provide a platform for some of that. Um, and we can only do it with you. And we can also, as you all know, only do it because of our sponsors. Um, and uh, I think the last couple of sessions, I've probably forgotten to acknowledge that our sponsors, but they are incredibly um, important to um, enabling us to, to run these events. This one's in collaboration with Monash, but of course, all the other parlor partners help with that too. Um, we've got the Path Ahead series that we're running on, on the website at the moment, where we're inviting older or experienced practitioners to reflect on what they've done in previous downturns um, to help those of you who are kind of experiencing this for the first time. So I just want to acknowledge um, the support of everybody, yourselves included, our sponsors, everybody. So thank you. And next week we'll be back again, Friday, lunchtime date. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming.